today um, on industry decarbonization is covering a lot of ground, right? And, and this is such an important topic. When um, you know, we're thinking about human and economic development, industrialization is really the underpinning for that. And I think about industry decarbonization sort of in three buckets. Um, the first is how do we decarbonize the actual processes that we're using within industry that produce emissions um, and other greenhouse gases, you know, it doesn't have to be just CO2. And, you know, these are things like uh, within cement and chemicals, and, and those account for about 5% of global emissions. And then we can think about how do we decarbonize the huge amounts of heat and power that we use within industry, and that accounts for about 25% of total global emissions. And finally, I think about, you know, how do we decarbonize the feedstocks that are primarily hydrocarbons at this point in time that are used directly, for example, in making things like hydrogen, um, or, you know, in processes like reducing steel. So I am thrilled to be moderating this panel. I feel like, um, you know, this is a topic which requires some really gritty people, and we have four all-stars on stage who are going to um, share with us what they're doing in this space around addressing uh, these sort of three pillars within industrial decarbonization. I'm going to take a moment and um, uh, say a few words about each of our panelists uh, before I invite each of them up in turn to give us a lightning talk and share some of their research and then we'll have a, have a discussion here. Uh, so our uh, first panelist is Professor Leora dresselhaus Murray. Uh, Leora is an assistant professor in the Department of Material Science and Engineering with a courtesy appointment in mechanical engineering and a term appointment in photon science at the Slack National Accelerator Lab. Leora studies how modern methods can enable new opportunities to update old school materials processing and manufacturing for sustainability uh, including uh, steel making, which she'll be talking about today. Uh, to Leora's right is Professor Tiziana Venorio, who is an Associate Professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences, and by courtesy Civil and Environmental Engineering and Geophysics, which is where we first met 20 years ago, I think. Uh, Tiziana's research involves the mechanical and chemical interactions of fluids with earth materials that drive many geologic as well as engineering processes, and today she's going to be talking to us about decarbonizing cement. Next we have uh, Professor Jonathan Fan, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical Engineering at Stanford, where he's researching new design methodologies and materials, and, uh, uh, sorry, and materials approaches to nanophotonic systems. And Jonathan's been working on developing alternatives to combusting fossil fuels to produce high-grade heat and power. And last but not least, uh, we have Dr. Sahar El Abadi, who is a postdoc in energy resources engineering. Her research focuses on developing circular economies by transforming waste methane into useful products, as well as quantifying and mitigating fugitive methane emissions to ensure gas feedstocks into industrial processes are as clean as possible. So we have a really broad range of topics here. Um, so, something for everyone, and with that, uh, I would like to invite Leora up to the podium to kick us off. You have a clicker, clicker with a big green arrow. Perfect. Awesome. Big green arrow. Good start to, the, to any talk, right? Okay, so uh, thank you all so much for coming. It's uh, my, my honor to get a chance to talk to you today about uh, decarbonizing uh, deep industry in, in regards to the steelmaking uh, industry in particular. Um, so, so as uh, Naomi nicely mentioned, my group focuses on, on using modern uh, toolboxes and technology, um, either you know, using photons at synchrotrons and at, at X-ray free electron lasers or novel computational approaches to be able to get some deeper insights to allow you know, modern science and technology to be able to start to push forward the large scale industrial problems that, that need to be decarbonized. 
So um, before we you know, dive into the science, it's important to remember why we care about steel. So uh, I probably don't have to make too great a point of this, but steel, it turns out, is ubiquitous in modern society. It was the underpinning that enabled the Industrial Revolution to uh, modernize society to what it is today. Uh, today we make one point, or at least last year, we made 1.92 gigatons of steel that year, and that produced 3.8-ish um, uh, um, gigatons of CO2 just from that process. So what does that mean? Well, you know, steel underpins our modern society. It's ubiquitous in our technology, but is 8% of the global CO2 emissions, and that number is actually only going up uh, demand is, is projected to increase by 35% by 2050. So you might ask yourself, well, where is all of this uh, emissions coming from? And, and the answer, when you look across the entire industry at all of the different parts of steel making, from uh, preparing the ores, then making uh, rocks into iron, iron into steel, and then steel into something that is useful to be able to build cars and windmills, uh, actually, half of the emissions there come from just making iron rocks into iron metal to be able to start the process of alloying. So when we look a little bit kind of big picture at what exactly iron making means here, we can see that this process is at such a big scale that no one solution is going to solve everything in time to avert catastrophe from climate change. So to be able to decarbonize this industry, what we need to think towards is every single step and trajectory within the time scale of being able to, to develop the next generation of clean technologies. So the way that I like to, to put this is that we have kind of three buckets that we need to think in. There's the bucket of how do we clean up and modernize today's infrastructure that is already in place to be able to at least clean up the infrastructure we have. Then the second uh, box is, you know, what are the transitional technologies that we need to start developing for things that we haven't yet figured out all the optimization tricks to be able to make work at the appropriate scales? But how do we get started on this process on building the infrastructure to decarbonize a gigaton scale industry? And then we need to start now, today, at building the carbon zero versions of these technologies so that within 100 years, we'll be able to roll those out at scale at the gigaton scale, and hopefully we'll do it in less than 100 years. So now let's look at the science, of course. So uh, when we take a deeper look at, at iron making, it turns out that uh, a lot of these CO2 emissions are not just because we're performing a process at 2600 Kelvin, sorry, Celsius. Uh, it's also that actually um, the carbon monoxide and carbon in coal is what is used as the active reagent to take these iron ores that are hematite um, and turn them into, uh, there's, there's three steps of reaction here, going from hematite to magnetite to wustite and then to iron. So that produces at least three molecules of CO2 just from the process itself, ignoring all of the heating requirements and things like that. So this is done today at incredibly large scales. It's 75% of the industry. Um, with furnaces that are 100 meter tall uh, that can, that called blast furnaces, that, that allow us to be able to, with layers, alternating layers of coal and uh, iron ores, be able to uh, do this type of conversion to get molten iron. So hydrogen offers an opportunity to be able to decarbonize the process itself, going instead of converting your carbon or carbon monoxide to CO2, it now offers you the opportunity to turn that into going from hydrogen to water that is easier to be able to capture afterwards with condensers and other types of technology. So this seems like, you know, the golden ticket, the winning ticket, but of course, like many things in industry, it's not quite that simple. Uh, first off, of course, hydrogen is difficult to make and especially difficult to make inexpensively. Um, but another pesky challenge here is that Hydrogen makes what is previously an exothermic reaction, generating heat to thermal runaway to be able to make a process that is really downhill once you get it started, to a four times more endothermic process that now becomes an incredibly difficult reaction to stabilize every time you increase the scale. So in my group, we look at connecting fundamental science at you know, going from the atomic scale picture 
of how the atoms are actually moving around, transporting through each other and propagating heat, all the way through uh, then exploring how to implement that into building the next generation of reactors to be able to either optimize the technology we have today or to be able to come up with the next generation of technologies of you know, tomorrow. So I'll, I'll focus in for today on, on some of our initial work that we've started doing really at the very fundamental scale. And I'll, I'll close today by, uh, by showing you where that, where that comes and how we connect the fundamentals back to these gigaton or megaton scale reactors uh, required to be able to decarbonize these, these processes. So as I showed before, you know, we have a beautiful phase diagram here where we're reducing these hematite ores uh, first to magnetite, then to wustite, and then to iron. But if you ask yourself, well, what is so difficult about this process? It turns out the last step is the rate lim limiting step because it couples the uh, interesting reactive chemistry to structural transformations that can cause the reactors to shut down and fail. Um, this is called the sticking or the whiskering mechanism by which effectively, as you convert from your iron oxide to your metallic iron phase, the transport of iron ends up actually bridging particles that are near each other, causing them to whisker and stick together, therefore causing what might in a reactor, either a fluidized bed reactor, which is one type of approach to scale this process, or a blast furnace and pellet based reactor, which is a different version of the process. Um, in both cases, it causes these sticking effects that ultimately prevent the reactor from continuing and cause catastrophic failure that then requires you to close down the reactor, clean everything up, and restart the problem. So to be able to design efficient reactors, we need to be able to understand the fundamental science that underlies these types of sticking mechanisms and whiskering, but we also need to be able to understand how to efficiently navigate this whiskering process to avert it from the optimized conditions, and the full range of optimized conditions to be able to be relevant in a reactor that is 10 meters wide. So as you start to try to ask that question at every length scale, what it turns out is that um, the answer looks very different at every single scale you ask it. Um, in fact, of course, uh, this problem has been studied for over 100 years. A lot is known at each scale, but being able to connect the dots between the scales is still an ongoing challenge that uh, prevents us from being able to push this technology towards the full macroscopic scale required for the, the reactors. So in our, our work, we've been looking at the smallest scales that are often overlooked at the large processes and trying to find ways in synergistically connecting these length scales to be able to, to describe them at the large scale of the process. So we you know, put on our, our, our hats and, and decided it's time to learn what the reactors are actually doing. So we got um, some industrial ore fines from US Steel from the Iron Range uh, here in, in Minnesota. And uh, we very quickly found that indeed when you look at these under a scanning electron microscope, you find that there are a lot of features and, and grains that are sub 10 nanometers in scale. So we as material scientists know that nanochemistry in these types of particles is not the same as the macroscopic chemistry that we typically would use to describe a reactor at this scale. So uh, we generated these, these 10 nanometer particles to be able to actually look at the process at the relevant length scale to be able to describe a scale that's, that's always been overlooked so far. So we went to the synchrotron and, and we did an experiment and we were able to show uh, as a function of temperature that, that these nanoparticles really do behave quite differently at these very unusually low temperatures. And, and at the lowest temperatures, we could actually separate each of the steps of the chemistry. And we were able to demonstrate that at 300 Celsius, actually, um, first off, in the nanoparticles, you generate a phase that you wouldn't normally see until the high temperatures. But second off, we, we demonstrated that this breaks down into three different stages. Uh, the first of these stages is this really rapid surface chemistry where all of the reactive sites on the surface are exposed and therefore the kinetics go rapidly through every single step of the process. Then um, in stage two, we start to slow down because we've passivated our surfaces and now our, our kinetics are, are dominated by diffusion um, or fixed laws and as we uh, you know, discuss in material science. Um, and then in stage three, we end up in a very different stage of this process where now we've gone a large step of the way through the, the formation or consumption of the, the magnetite 
And now we start to convert to iron. And as that happens, we were able to demonstrate with this uh, 3D uh, tychotomographic imaging how the nucleation and growth of the, um, of the iron phase actually couples to the sintering of the particles at this small scale, causing them to increase in length scale by a hundredfold. Even though we started with 10 nanometer particles that who would care at the gigaton scale? So what this really shows you is the beginning of, of a long uh, term of work that we're doing in my group now, laying the groundwork to be able to enable this type of multi-scale uh, view of the process to be able to link and connect the dots between the scales that have often been overlooked and the full reactor performance. But of course, you might be sitting there asking yourself, well, Leora, come on. How, does this, how is this relevant to these huge reactors? So I, I have a little roadmap here laid out for you guys to show you how this type of really fundamental science actually does connect to these megaton scale reactors. So we start with interdependent driving forces that we understand from uh, kinetics modeling and such are incredibly important to be able to effectively and accurately describe the process. Then we go to the synchrotron and we do our measurements to be able to really effectively validate our models. But then we translate those with reactor scale models to be able to uh, inform which are the relevant uh, order parameters to describe the process with the full fidelity of the kinetics that I just described. And then we start to do some techno-economic analysis to be able to effectively show, you know, now that we understand the process, how to make it work effectively, how do we know how to ask the right questions to be able to roll out this technology uh, actually for, for commercial use and then finally, we start off by building those actual pilot scale reactors to be able to demonstrate not just that it works in theory, but it works in practice, and to be able to do the refining and such at, at the relevant scales. We already have some partnerships with a couple different companies to be able to make this translation really happen. So long-term solutions, like what I'm describing for carbon zero steel, have to be prioritized today to be able to enable full industry decarbonization when we really need it. So on that note, uh, thank you all for listening. I will happily take questions at the appropriate time and uh, looking forward to discussion. Thank you, Leora. I'm actually gonna take the liberty of asking a question because I feel like it's gonna be hard to ask one question that will be appropriate for everyone. So I'm gonna ask each of you a question after your, your talk and then we'll open it up at the end to the crowd. So, you know, I'm. I'm really interested in, um, you're working with the steel industry, and how are they receptive to this idea that, you know, you've got to sort of invest today to ensure that we're, you know, limiting em emissions with the current facilities while investing in potentially a whole new build out down the road, right? So can you talk a little bit about how they're thinking about this strategy? It's an excellent question and, and a very important one to ask. So in this industry, uh, mining and extraction is an industry that works at a very large scale and is very conservative. Um, it, it, you know, there's, there's a running joke in the field that you have to really be able to demonstrate your work at about 100 kilotons per year scale to be able to really be relevant and demonstrate that it's worth scaling beyond that. And while that might be a joke, it's not so far off from valid. Uh, and so what we often find in this industry is that um, startup companies uh, are, a, are the ones that are able to push hardest at the carbon zero versions of the technology. But um, the big corporations in steel need to be working on cleaning up the infrastructure of today. And so this is where kind of those three pillars that I showed are really important. Um, because they translate between kind of each of the, the layers of this that are required to be able to decarbonize, and everyone needs to see this as a priority to be able to have a diff make a difference at each scale, uh, time scale. I would say the other aspect of this that has been really uh, refreshing to see over the last year or two is that um, some of the very, very large companies, these are huge multi-trillion dollar corporations, some of them are also now starting to um, invest in s clean steel startup companies. And so they have uh, accelerator programs for mid-scale versions of, um, of uh, startup companies that have already gotten to the scale that they've demonstrated at maybe 
10 kilotons per year. Uh, so not quite the 100 you would need to be able to get the funding to build a multi uh, billion dollar plant, but at least enough to be able to demonstrate that it's, it's, a, it's an, uh, an industry or an approach that really is pushing the frontier and is viable. And um, you started seeing some of these companies now start to invest in, in startups that are enabling that. And so I think that's actually probably going to be the thing of the future, is watching how the, the large and established companies invest in the technologies of tomorrow. And we'll see you know, who ends up being uh, what, what the tea leaves read, but uh, it's been really promising thus far. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Tiziana, I'd like to invite you up to the podium. Thank you for having me and uh, for joining uh, today. Um, the focus uh, of my talk today is on geomimetic um, cement. Uh, I'm very, um, very happy to share uh, the latest uh, development of this uh, technology. So the focus is on geomimetic, geomimetic cement. I will show uh, what we are doing and most importantly why, and I will start with the uh, why. But before doing that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the team. Um, it's a very, as, as, so far has been really interesting collaborating across disciplines. I'm a rock physicist. I'm collaborating with Alberto Saleo, who is a material scientist, and Matteo Carniello, who is a, a um, chemical engineering. And then we have two fantastic uh, postdocs from the geoscience uh, side and then from the engineering side and the students, undergraduate and graduate students who are moving the first step. So a very exciting um, team. And I, I also like to acknowledge um, OTL that this year has decided to highlight our technology for uh, their report. So I, I mentioned that I would like to start from the why. Uh, why do we need a different cement and why we are focusing on a geomimetic? Um, cement. So there are, when it comes to, to um, um, cement, there are three challenges and need. The first one is the reason why we are uh, gathering uh, here uh, today. We need to decarbonize uh, that uh, industry. Cement manufacturing is responsible for eight to 10 uh, of the world's CO2 emissions. Uh, the reason is because uh, if we do not include or neglect transportation. Uh, CO2, at least one third, comes from the use of energy uh, that is used to calcine uh, the carbonate rock. And then two thirds, or 70%, comes from the reaction uh, that breaks down the calcite mineral and um, um, uh, ob to obtain uh, the uh, calcium oxide or the lime. So from here, we can make a first reflection. If tomorrow, for example, we are going to have the cleanest energy resource, we would take care only of one third, but we still have to deal uh, with uh, reducing uh, the emissions, and so the, the two thirds of 70%. So for this, we need a different rock. And, uh, and that's how geoscience, the, 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 the role that geoscience uh, place, and so we need a low carbon binder uh, precursor. The second challenge and, and the need is that um, cement is a great uh, material but has one flaw, and the flaw is it needs reinforcement because the, the um, um, tensile strength uh, is low. And so reinforcement is really a blessing and a curse because it's good, but at the same time, uh, as Leora uh, just mentioned, um, the stain, uh, stainless steel and, and so the, that is used for rebars um, create even more emissions. The second thing is that uh, rebars are responsible for the corrosion um, uh, of concrete and then create spalling. And uh, we can also think of reinforcing the cement at lower uh, scale by using uh, fibers that are added to the slurry. However, because the, the fibers have different composition with respect to the matrix, normally uh, the materials experience what is called debonding or fibers uh, pull out. And, and then there is another uh, problem. The more fibers we have, 
clear is better because the strength and the ductility of the material increases, but then the higher is the, the greater is the viscosity of the paste, which then brings uh, lower uh, workability of the slurry. So what if we decide to reinforce the cement at the nanoscale by growing fibers in situ? The third uh, challenge is serviceability. Um, there are many applications from, um, uh, from uh, aerospace to the subsurface. We need to take care uh, or we need to uh, make sure that cement, um, the integrity of cement remains um, as it is for a long time, especially if we're dealing with harsh environment. Just for uh, your knowledge and just as an example, here in this plot, I'm showing that 50%, and this plot is uh, derived from uh, the analysis of 18,000 wells in the Gulf of Mexico. So 50% of the wells experience sustained casing pressure, so excessive pressure on the casing of the wells after just 15 years of production. And about 15% of primary cement jobs fail, costing the oil and gas industry more um, than uh, 45, four, uh, 450 uh, millions uh, annually in remedial uh, cementing work. So for this reason, we need a different material, an enhanced um, cement that uh, um, has an, an enhanced response to stress uh, changes, temperature, and chemical attack. And Clearly, when we talk about serviceability, uh, serviceability is uh, extremely linked to safety. Uh, and we all remember the Deep Horizon oil uh, rig blowout, which was due to um, poor design, so a cement flow uh, design. So what are, what is the material that includes all these properties? Clearly, those are uh, rocks. And so our um, technology is focusing on uh, uh, geomimicry because there are certain rocks that um, have low carbon composition. Um, clearly, Earth has already calcined those rocks, and so uh, especially volcanic rocks do not contain the carbon ion. Um, some of these rocks uh, have uh, exhibit uh, high strain energy uh, because of the presence of fibers that grow into uh, the material directly. And some of these uh, fibers exhibit an um, entangled uh, structure, uh, which we will see uh, is important. And then we know many times rocks bear uh, harsh environments, whether it's temperature, uh, and then clearly they also self-heal. So we are working on this um, technology and uh, uh, we're focusing on uh, an alternative raw material as a binder that is made of a volcanic rock blend. A volcanic rock cannot contain a CO2 uh, ion because again, uh, Earth has already calcined uh, this rock and uh, uh, this rock can replace uh, the limestone uh, rock. On your right, you see a, a, a plot showing the reduction. There is a drastic reduction in CO2 uh, upon uh, calcination. But just to, this is a different way of showing with respect to Portland cement, we can have a reduction of CO2 that is depending on the uh, calcium silicon uh, ratio that goes from 50% to uh, 70%. We still need to calcine these rocks just to transform the minerals into uh, oxides. So calcination is still uh, required. Once the, the calcined material is uh, created, um, the, the material is uh, exposed to hydrothermal synthesis. The, the composition does not, as you have seen, does not have a lot of calcium, but uh, has uh, alkali-rich uh, minerals. And this, it forms the same minerals that are formed in, uh, um, in, uh, uh, to, uh, in uh, Portland cement. Mention we need fibers that grow and we use hydrothermal synthesis. The most important thing uh, here is that the fibers needs to be uh, entangled. Why? Uh, because we see that 
um, the, the entanglement of the fibers uh, plays an important role on the strain uh, absorbance. Um, if the fibers are straight, the stress is higher, but the, the, the strain is much uh, smaller. So in order to get the same um, stress, you just need to use more fibers and grow more fibers into the material. At the end, our material uh, is in between Portland cement uh, based and uh, alkali activated or geopolymer, so it's a hybrid uh, composition. Uh, and in this uh, plot here, you see the bonds, uh, the um, uh, silicon oxygen um, uh, bonds. And normally, in a hybrid material, the, the um, uh, FTIR response is in between. And interestingly enough, this is the same response that Roman Marie Concrete has. So Roman Marie Concrete is also an hybrid and uh, naturally cemented cap rocks that exhibit uh, high um, uh, strain absorbance. So as a summary, we are using a calcalkaline uh, volcanic rock blend that has low uh, carbon footprint. Uh, we use in situ growth of mineral fibers for reinforcement. And most importantly, the, the fibers must have an entangled structure at the nano micro scale to favor uh, strain energy absorbance. And so at the end, this alkaline and, uh, uh, and the calcium uh, composition makes the, the blend a hybrid that is in between the Portland cement and uh, uh, the geopolymers. Uh, um, if you want to know more, yesterday or today, there is a, a poster. Uh, so um, please see uh, Davides and George uh, and Jorge uh, poster. These are the, the first uh, uh, experiments that we are uh, making. And, and so it's interesting to see that despite the high porosity, so this is really high, um, um, a, a lightweight um, cement, the, uh, the, the stress of failure is uh, um, uh, very um, promising, uh, and this is not yet the reinforced materials. So I um, thank you for your attention, and uh, at some point I will answer your questions. Thank you. Well, I want to know more. Um, <laughs> I, so I'm curious, the, uh, the durability and the serviceability, is that what you called it? Yeah. Um, how do you think about those in terms of life cycle assessment of, uh, I guess, both emissions and cost? Yeah, sure. So I, as I mentioned, um, clearly the focus is on reducing uh, the energy emission and also finding another material that uh, emits uh, less CO2 compared to the carbon uh, rocks. But uh, I still believe that when it comes to concrete, um, durability and, and serviceability should be factored in uh, in, the, um, in the life uh, of uh, um, concrete. Um, because clearly, the more durable is the material, uh, the, the, the impact, the environmental impact uh, is spread over a long period of time. Uh, clearly, uh, it uh, will use less resources. It will create less uh, waste. And so just for that, the, the durability and the, 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 the serviceability of the material should be uh, considered when uh, having um, or making uh, a new recipe. But in my opinion, there is also something that sometimes uh, is not um, often uh, looked at, and is the fact that sometimes um, there are situations, there are applications where the cost for replacement are too high. And, uh, and so in that case, uh, there is a lot of pressure on communities or even um, um, uh, consumers uh, that, that do not come or from privileged, uh, um, or, or you know, um, they, they come from socioeconomic um, 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 disadvantaged um, um, areas. So, so at the end, I see serviceability and durability not only important as the properties of the material, but also a way to um, 
it, it's also important to make materials m more um, equitable uh, for um, yeah, and accessible know, to communities. Yeah, great. All right, I um, we're going to move right along here. So Jonathan's going to give a talk while he's walking up the podium. Um, I recognize that I have the luxury of asking these amazing professors um, questions anytime. So when we're done with the talks, you're going to get your opportunity. So be jotting down your questions as we go here. All right, Jonathan, over to you. All right, thank you. And it's a real privilege to get to tell you about some of the work we've been doing in electrified uh, reactor systems. Uh, as we've already talked about throughout this whole week, uh, nearly a third of greenhouse gas emissions are due to industrial processing of materials and chemicals. We've already seen two really great examples of this in the steel and cement industry, but it's certainly not limited to that. It's really everything that you see around you in this room, the pulp and paper industry, uh, the food industry, and for me, uh, and what will be the focus of this talk, uh, the gas reforming industry, uh, where high-grade heat is used to do everything from producing ammonia and hydrogen to ethylene. Uh, the majority of these emissions uh, in the chemical industry are due to fossil fuel combustion uh, to produce this high-grade heat. And that is really something that I want to focus on here. Now, as we've uh, seen throughout this uh, week, and as you know, there are going to be a lot of really promising ways to use electrochemistry and photocatalysis, uh, to name a couple of ways, to begin to reduce the amount of heat required for uh, the chemical industry. But we should also uh, be reminded ourselves of just how incredibly uh, efficient and uh, this industry is and how catalysts and processes have been developed, not just for the last decades, but for the last centuries. And as such, thermal chemical processing will continue to serve as the predominant chemical synthesis platform in industry. I'm showing a couple of examples of how high-grade heat is used in the gas reforming industry, typically in order to get heat into these reactors, uh, schemes based on wall heating or uh, heat transfer uh, with, through heat transfer fluids are used. These are extremely well-known and, and mature technologies, um, uh, but this gives you the idea of the type of infra infrastructure required uh, in processes today. So, of course, as we start to think about decarbonization and specifically decarbonization on time scales that uh, are really important in the world today, which is to say over the next couple of decades, one way to really address this problem is to think about generating high-grade heat with green electricity. Now, there are, are, of course, many ways to generate heat from electricity. You simply have to look around your own kitchen to see uh, that there are methods based on resistive heating, inductive heating, and microwave heating, amongst others, uh, that are used, uh, which begs, of course, a couple of questions. You know, the first is, uh, which one of these methods do we actually want to consider? And the second is, are there actually new things to be done in this domain, or is this actually a very mature topic? What I'd like to argue is that this is not actually a solved problem and that there's a really big opportunity, which is to co-design the electrified heating method with chemical reaction engineering to enhance the performance of chemical reactors today. By performance, I refer to uh, achieving higher conversion efficiencies, mitigation of parasitic thermal gradients within reactors, and to potentially have smaller reactors and process intensified, intensified processes due to the fact that um, most uh, reactions today are, endo, are uh, many of them uh, are endothermic, and that heat transfer is in fact a bottleneck for these type of reactor processes. In fact, I would argue that the development of new capabilities is really necessary if we want to uh, start utilizing in practical ways green electricity for heat uh, because of the relatively high cost of green electricity compared to the combustion of methane today. So it's not going to be sufficient, for example, to electrify a boiler and to use uh, heat transfer fluids in the old-fashioned way to actually uh, come up with a techno-economic argument, but we're actually going to have to significantly reduce capital costs and improve the performance of these type of reactors. Uh, so our group has been uh, really thinking about this co-design problem, and we are developing chemical reactors in which the inductive heating of free-form susceptors enables fully customized, customizable volumetric temperature profiles. So by susceptors, I'm referring to internal structures within the reactor, which are three-dimensional, that can be heated in ways where the uh, heat uh, volumetrically as well as temporally uh, can be fully customizable. 
uh, these reactors eliminate thermal transfer of bottlenecks, which is to say the amount of energy that can be delivered to catalysts uh, can significantly exceed those of conventional uh, reactors methods, thereby improving conversion efficiency, eliminating many of the parasitic bottlenecks that we uh, see in current reactor technologies, and what this ultimately does is enable reductions in uh, reactor form factor. Uh, the key uh, for making this happen is, in fact, uh, advances at uh, many different stages, and I just want to talk about this at a very high level, though I'm happy to talk about this in uh, more detail later. Uh, many of these ideas uh, really stem from electromagnetics. My background is uh, really in understanding the relationship between uh, uh, geometric structures and their interaction with electromagnetic waves. And over the last two decades, there have been some really new theories on how structured media can interact with electromagnetic waves in order to achieve uh, des certain types of desired properties, some more exotic. And in this case, we're talking about uniform or uh, tailorable heating profiles. Uh, there have been some incredible advances in manufacturing, where again, especially with the emergence of, of uh, of uh, the current state of air, the aerospace industry, it is now possible to additively manufacture uh, super alloy materials uh, and even uh, complex uh, conductive ceramic materials uh, to have nearly any type of form factor and shape, which really introduces the possibility of uh, truly customizing uh, what we can do with reactors. So in fact, in the chemical reaction space, this has uh, taken the, uh, the terminology of of, of uh, structured uh, reactor engineering. Uh, scientific computing has certainly advanced tremendously uh, uh, over the last, uh, again, couple of decades where uh, we're really looking to push the limits of multi-physics, multi-scalar uh, computation involving fluids, heat transfer, and electromagnetic coupling. These are extremely complex problems that require not just interfacing with supercomputing infrastructure, but also uh, new ways of accelerating these, uh, these computing means using, for example, machine learning. And a major uh, uh, point of, of, uh, of value add that we've been focusing on with my collaborator Juan Rivas has been recent developments in power electronics where wideband gut semiconductors uh, made from uh, uh, gallium uh, nitride and silicon carbide-based uh, switching technologies now enable switching uh, at very high frequencies, uh, including megahertz frequencies. And it's really the collection of, every, of all of these different ideas that really enable the co-design of the inductive heating process with reaction engineering, which is to say that uh, in, in, in ultimately combining all of this together, we are able to create reactors uh, in which uh, uniform heating and uh, is able to be achieved, and where ultimately, uh, where we are able to optimize not just for heating, but also for mass transfer and heat transfer. Uh, we have uh, theoretically and experimentally verified uh, these volumetric heating concepts, including uniform volumetric heating with high surface area to volume susceptors with efficiencies that are over 90%. Uh, one of the uh, really difficult parts for us, uh, in fact, that we're trying to tackle is this question of efficiency with induction heating, which for many typical applications, such as welding, people don't think about efficiency, but for the energy space, efficiency is everything. And uh, we are currently uh, testing our concept with uh, mesoscale reactors for electrifying uh, the reverse wire gas shift reaction, in fact, working with my uh, colleague Matt Cannon in chemistry, I believe he filled you in. Uh, uh, earlier this week on work he's been doing on state-of-the-art uh, carbonate catalyst for reverse wire gas shift. Um, it, like all endothermic uh, reactions, uh, still requires methods to uh, deliver volumetric and uh, heat into, into uh, the uh, side of the catalyst. I, I want to uh, maybe end on a broader picture, which is that if we look at the reactor landscape today, we are typically dealing with either very small reactors, which is to say micro reactors, where the enhanced surface area to volume enables uh, superior heat and mass transfer. Um, and um, as such, there's a cottage industry in micro reactors uh, where very high performance can be had on small scales. Um, and also very large scale reactors. And of course, when we visit the exons and the shells, we're talking about uh, huge refineries with uh, close to gigawatt type uh, energy consumptions in order to 
uh, achieve uh, uh, incredible performance um, um, with low cost. But that as we start thinking about the chemical industry on a more, uh, on, on a more uh, sustainable platform, uh, there will need to be uh, new distributed infrastructure uh, where we may not necessarily be thinking about just building huge refineries everywhere, but where we may be thinking about uh, more mesoscale reactors. And as we go about uh, designing these reactors to optimize for all major chemical reaction engineering phenomena, that we essentially will have uh, mesoscale reactors that can operate with uh, one or tens of megawatts, uh, but that have the capabilities of micro reactors in terms of uh, heat, mass, uh, transport, and such. Um, lastly, I want to acknowledge my team. It's been uh, tremendously gratifying, and I think similar to what Tiziana was showing, uh, we have a, a very interdisciplinary group of people uh, in electrical, mechanical, chemical, uh, material science. We're even working with someone at Slack. And I think it's very clear as we look to uh, continue to uh, really push uh, what we uh, push these uh, topics in electrified uh, chemical reaction systems that this is definitely a, a topic that's going to require a, a tremendous leverage from every major uh, engineering department on campus. And uh, so stay tuned. I think uh, uh, the last thing I'll say is that in, in, in developing these ideas for uh, high temperature gas reforming reactors, it's, it's also extremely clear that uh, the ability to control heat as a function of of uh, volume and time in nearly arbitrary ways uh, with temporal resolution down to uh, microseconds um, is actually something that, that will benefit a great deal of technologies and not just thermochemical reactors. All right, thank you. All right, let's get real. Are we really gonna scale this from the lab out to the scale we need for commercial processes? We got, what, 25% of Total energy is in industrial heat and power. Talk to us about that a little bit. Yeah, that, that's a great question. I think, you know, uh, 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 when I started thinking about these ideas around three years ago, um, you know, and if you read the, the literature, there's um, a lot of academic demonstrations showing topics in, you know, you know micro scale resistive heaters, uh, microwave heaters, you know, at the lab scale. And, and there's no question if you're looking to do a small academic exp uh, experiment that pretty much any, any method can be tailored to something. Um, but a big reason for us to focus on inductive heating is uh, at least two reasons um, uh, when we're talking about scale. Uh, the first is that it is currently used at scale in certain industries, like the metallurgy industry, um, where uh, inductive heating furnaces are used at uh, tens of megawatt capacities uh, for, uh, for example, the melting of, of metals. Mm -hmm. So uh, we know that the infrastructure is there and the concepts are there. Uh, of course, adapting it towards uh, something like gas uh, reforming is, 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 is what we're trying to do, but that there is a pathway to scaling. And the second comes down to understanding how you know, the grid and how power works at megawatt, uh, frequent, at megawatt power levels where you're no longer even going to be using power electronics, but ideally you'd like to use wall plug, you know, very high uh, voltage uh, type of sources. And, and that's of course, you know, one of, the, one of the really compelling reasons for us to use inductive heating because of just the mechanism, we are potentially able to directly use uh, electricity from a generator uh, without additional uh, transformation. So, so we, we do see inductive heating playing a major role in scaled technologies uh, uh, in industry. Great, thank you. All right, moving on, Saha, last but not least. Thank you so much, it's wonderful to be here today. Today I'm going to be discussing methane emissions and how greenhouse gas, how new technologies are revolutionizing greenhouse gas detection and mitigation. Methane is a potent greenhouse gas. It has over 25 times the global warming potential of carbon dioxide over a 100 year time period and contributes about 30% of the temperature increase that we're going to be seeing associated with climate change. There are several different anthropogenic and natural sources of methane. Key among these is oil and gas production and use. 
And while this is a key contributor of anthropogenic methane emissions, it also is a ready target for, co for cost-effective mitigation. However, mitigating methane emissions requires that we are able to identify methane sources, which brings us to the question, how do we currently measure methane? And this is the work that myself and several others at Stanford have been focusing on for the past several years. Conventional approaches for measuring methane involve individual site visits. So for example, a technician with a handheld device, such as an infrared camera, or a handheld sensor would visit a site and monitor every piece of equipment in order to determine the leak rate of methane on site. This was improved somewhat with sensors mounted on vehicles. However, both of these conventional approaches are incredibly time and labor intensive, and they often do require on-site access in order to obtain measurements. As a result, new technologies have come into this space and are aiming to improve our ability to measure methane. And I'll walk you through what some of these classes of technologies are now. The first of these are on-site sensors. These will be deployed throughout uh, a facility and continuously measure the concentration of methane and in, or in order to determine if there is a leak or a flow rate of methane on site. This has numerous potential advantages. You collect incredibly high resolution temporal data. This could also provide very rapid alert for leak detection, and these can be deployed for an extended period of time. However, you still do likely require on-site access and cooperations with operators. So the next class of, air, of technologies aims to address some of those issues, um, and these are airplanes. There are several different uh, technologies that are being deployed in this space, but most of them rely on hyperspectral imaging and the shortwave infrared. This is an image from our field work from 2021 uh, in which an airplane flew over a methane plume, conducted a, a snapshot image, and, and identified the source of methane. This technology poses several uh, potential advantages. You have with the ability to conduct entire basin-wide surveys, rapid and widespread spatial coverage. No on-site access is required, and this allows for unbiased sampling in order to get a more accurate assessment of methane emissions. However, you're measuring methane concentrations from several thousand feet in the air. As a result, you can expect higher detection limits, and also, many of these technologies rely on reflected sunlight, and thus you need favorable weather conditions and minimal cloud cover. Additionally, they only provide sort of a one-moment snapshot in time. Finally, the last class of technologies that I'll be introducing you today are satellites. And these operate very similarly to the airplanes as the satellite is passing in its orbit overhead. It collects images and evaluates methane enhancement in order to identify potential methane leaks. And this is another photo from our research group's uh, recent publication uh, by Sherwin et al. 2023 in which a satellite here identified this methane plume. Satellites can provide you with truly global coverage, which is the key advantage here for this approach. Um, this is really how you can achieve rapid scalability with regular repeated uh, observations of the same location. However, of course, now we're measuring methane not just several thousand feet in the air, as was the case with airplanes, but through the entire atmosphere. And as a result, you can expect even higher detection limits, of course, the same weather limitations associated with cloud cover apply, and these are also incredibly expensive to launch. With all of these novel technologies entering this space, this begs the question, how well do they work? And this is what we decided to find out. Over the last several years, my research group, led by Professor Adam Brandt here at Stanford, has been developing and pioneering methods for evaluating methane detection technologies. I, read, I led our most recent campaign, which was last fall, and our most ambitious one to date. We conducted two full months of testing located in the desert outside of Phoenix and tested over 20 different technology types. Our participants in this campaign are displayed on this slide, and we really attempted to bring together all of the major players in the methane detection space. The participants in this campaign analyzed data ranging from that collected by drones, 
to airplanes, satellites, and ground-based sensors. And these participants represent university research groups, nonprofit organizations, startups, as well as fully mature companies. We tested five different airplane teams that use varying methods, as well as nine different satellites. These satellites are both privately owned as well as owned and operated by various international space agencies ranging from the United States, the German Space Agency, Italian Space Agency, and the Chinese Space Agency. And we worked with our partners in order to provide the data collected from these satellites to six different analysis teams. We also evaluated eight different continuous monitors. This is a combination of point sensors, metal oxide sensors, and infrared cameras, which were deployed throughout our field site, collecting data throughout the entire two-month period. We work very closely with the different test participants in order to develop testing protocols. And this schematic on the slide shows what testing an airplane might look like. Methane is an invisible gas, but we can visualize our release stack in the image to your right, uh, which shows the plume that we are releasing. Stanford, our Stanford team on the ground controls the release rate from our workstation where the Stanford logo is. Um, and we, can, we release a known amount of gas to us that we do not disclose to the test participants. And we ask the test participants, in this case the airplane that's flying overhead, to conduct routine survey operations and closely mimic their field operations as much as possible. We work very closely as well with Rawhide Leasing. They operate our natural gas equipment. We use compressed natural gas, which you can see in the trailers next to the Rawhide logo as well. And we work very closely with them sort of on conducting this, uh, this, this type of field testing. So after collecting two months of data for over the 20 different teams that we participated, we are currently um, deep in data analysis mode and preparing our results. And one thing that we're really proud of and excited about is the fact that the results from all of our testing for all of these companies are fully transparent and identifiable. When we publish our results, they will appear alongside the names of the companies. And this is to advance R&D as well as to provide full transparency for operators. However, while we're still currently analyzing results, I'm excited to be able to share with you a sneak peek of our satellite and our airplane data. And this is just to give you a sense, this is sort of hot off the press um, of what we're seeing. So to start off with the satellites that we tested, this is work um, and analysis that's being conducted by my colleague, Dr. Evan Sherwin, also a postdoc in our research group. Um, so in a moment, I'll, I'll sort of reveal the different data points that we collected, but I'll walk you through the plot first so you understand what you're looking at. So on the x-axis, this is our ground truth metered release rate. So that's sort of our known flow rate of methane that we're releasing. And on the y-axis is the reported value um, by the test participant. Each of the points represents a measurement. They are color-coded based on the satellite, and the shape of the, of the point indicates which team was conducting the analysis. These are our satellite results. This looks, there are large error bars and it may look sort of a bit scattered, but I'd like to point out a few uh, key points uh, here. This is the only way that we can truly achieve global coverage. And if you look on the whole at the aggregate trend of these data, you see that they are in line with the X equals Y parity line. So while we may miss smaller releases here with satellites, we are overall, able to get a fairly good sense of what is happening on the ground. And this is an incredibly hard problem, which only has room to improve in the next few years as we're going to see the launching of several methane-specific satellites. As for our airplane results, the plot is very similar. You'll see our metered x-axis. Uh, uh, the x-axis represents our metered methane release rate, and the y-axis represents the um, the quantification estimate that we, uh, by the participant that we were testing. So we tested five different airplanes. I didn't want to play favorites, so I selected one and anonymized them for the purposes of today. Um, and this is what this particular uh, test result looked like. And you can see that this aircraft performed incredibly well. The parity line is very close to, or sort of the best fit line is very close to our X equals Y parity line. And they're able to accurately quantify emissions spanning orders of magnitude as low as 30 kilograms per hour up to nearly 
1,500 kilograms per hour. Overall, our results indicate that these novel technologies are incredibly promising for improving our ability to, de to detect methane. But what does this mean for climate change? And here I'd like to highlight the work by some of my colleagues at Stanford who are analyzing the data sets that are produced by airplanes who conduct surveys similar to the results from the one that I just showed. This is work by Yuanlei Chen and Dr. Evan Sherwin, and they used data from Kairos Aerospace that surveyed the Permian Basin, an oil and gas producing region in the United States. And here they found that we are seeing larger methane emissions than, uh, than, than expected, far greater, sev uh, several fold greater than those reported for the same region in EPA's greenhouse gas emissions inventory. This is the work that analyzes data from one oil and gas producing region, but Evan Sherwin ex extrapolated this to six different oil and gas producing regions across the United States using over one million measurements collected by aircrafts. And I'd just like to point out that this is really the scale that we are able to achieve with aircraft measurements. Just several years ago, collecting one million measurements with individual site levels would have been a nearly impossible feat. Evans' analysis found that less than 1.5% of sites contribute up to 80% of emissions. So we are seeing both larger emissions than expected, but the key culprits are a very small number of very large so aircrafts and satellites who are helping us revise our understanding of what the methane budget is in the United States, however, can also play a key role in helping us identify and fix these large emissions. However, in order to meet our global climate targets, we still are going to need to identify leaks that are below the lower detection limits of airplanes, and so this is a very active and ongoing area of research. I would like to thank sort of the entire Stanford methane group led by Professor Adam Brandt and all the students and postdocs who are involved in this work and have contributed immensely uh, to the work that I shared today, um, as well as the funding sources for our field work this past fall, um, Stanford Natural Gas Initiative, as well as the Environmental Defense Fund, Global Methane Hub, and the UN Environmental Program. Um, and finally, I'd just like to end by thanking our partners at Rawhide Leasing and Volta Fabrication, who we work with very closely on designing and operating all of our equipment for these field studies. Thank you so much. Yeah, why don't you come and take a seat? So I'm curious, Saha, how well do you think you're replicating the real oil and gas operations out there in the Arizona desert by the way, you're a badass being out in the desert for months on end. But yeah, do you think it's uh, do you think it's an accurate representation of what's actually going on in the field? Yeah, thank you, Naomi. Um, so our release apparatus can be thought of as sort of an unlit flare. So this does mimic the type of point source emissions that we do expect to see in oil and gas operations. The other aspect of this question that you asked is, is how, or the other sort of facet of, of this question um, is how the operators are conducting their assessment. And so here we ask all of the operators that we're testing to mimic their field conditions as closely as possible. So we ask them to use the same sort of data collection process, data analysis pipeline, et cetera. I think the real key difference is that in our studies, we are telling the operators where to look. So they don't know how much we're releasing or even whether or not we're releasing, but they do know the location to look. And so I think that's, that's sort of allowing them to see things that if they didn't know where to look, they might not have seen some of our smaller releases. And so I think that's sort of where we're moving forward in this area. Great, thank, thank you. you. All right, let's open it up. Questions? Raise your hand right here, sir. Uh, let's get a microphone. Um, uh, my name is Vishwanath. Uh, I'm a postdoc at SunCat. Uh, my question is to Leora. First of all, thank you so much for the great talk. Um, so I have two parts to my question. Uh, first is, uh, there's a lot of innovation happening in uh, Europe, uh, particularly related to green steel. There's this company I've heard, uh, H2 Green Steel, I think, in Sweden. Uh, they are almost on the verge of commercializing uh, green steel uh, using uh, uh, renewable energy powered uh, uh, electrolytic hydrogen. So uh, can you talk a little bit about how the technology is different from the conventional uh, blast furnace based uh, technology? And uh, the second part of my question is, uh, for a country like India, where majority of the steel industry 
is uh, based on uh, this coal-based blast furnaces. How do you uh, envision transitioning into greener steel production or like decarbonizing that sector? Uh, great questions. Um, I will start with the second one, and uh, you can maybe remind me of the first one if I get off track. Okay. Um, so India is a really interesting example. India currently is the second largest producer of steel on the planet, um, but is in the process right now of expanding their base of steel-making facilities by 100% over the next 10 years. So what does that mean for steel in India? Well, that means that India is one of the epicenters in the world right now of enabling this green transition because the platform is already there and the funding is already there to be able to roll out these new facilities at the appropriate scale to be able to really have an impact by 2030, by 2035, on you know, really, really lowering the bar or raising the bar in terms of uh, amount of steel emission or of CO2 emissions from steel. Um, and right now there's an interesting uh, interaction that's going on between the Indian government and the Indian, uh, the Indian research programs and, and corporations to try to figure out how to get that implemented in the appropriate time. And there's a lot of discussion there. I, I probably can't get into it right now, but I'd love to chat with you afterwards because if you're interested, now is actually the time and India is the place to really make a big impact in terms of, of rolling out this type of, of green technology. Um, the other question that you asked was about the, um, the hybrid plant in, in Sweden, yeah. which um, I will actually broaden your comment to a bigger comment, which is that at this point there are um, demonstrations of three technologies that are opportunities for carbon zero steel that have reached the pilot plant stage and have been demonstrated at the pilot, place, pilot scale stage and are at the cusp of being possible for really rolling it out at scale. Um, absolutely, this is a game changer. I, I don't want to misspeak at all. This is incredibly important for the steel making industry and this should not be understated. That said, this is also not the first time this has happened. So the first version of a pure hydrogen, you know, zero carbon steel that reached the pilot phase was in 1954. Wow. And none thus far have actually gone from the pilot scale to actually reaching the full scale, except for one example, and that was um, funded by ArcelorMittal, sorry, by Cleveland, Cleveland Cliffs, um, and uh, was a uh, technology that effectively was rolled out in Trinidad to be able to use fluidized bed technology to use pure hydrogen for this. And that, after eight years of actually truly reaching megaton scale, ended up closing down because of an issue in the economics of it that they forecasted with a little bit off and they weren't able to meet the production required to be able to actually make it profitable. And so this is one of the things that's so challenging is as much as I make it seem like a science problem, it's actually not just a science problem. It's a problem that we need to be thinking about the techno-economics of the system as we're developing the technology because it's not enough to come up with the technology if we're aiming for a gigaton scale. You have to be asking the questions that can actually make it profitable on day one. Otherwise, you're never gonna be able to roll it out in a way that's meaningful. So there are three different types that have reached the, this phase by now. One of them is, um, called uh, the um, falling particle reactor um, one of that, that rolled out in Utah. One of them is called the molten oxide electrolysis that's in Boston. And one of them is the hybrid facility that's in Sweden. Um, I encourage you to check them out and uh, to get involved if you can come up with your own because you know, it's, really, it's really important that we, we continue this progress. So I wanna build on that. We just have two minutes left. So this is gonna be like rapid fire. Um, you know, you mentioned a really good point, right? We're focused on the technologies, developing the technologies, but we've got to think about cost and also about policy. So as you interact with companies, industries in your respective areas, can you just say a few words about what you're seeing in terms of their motivation to decarbonize? Do you feel like there are 
adequate policies in place and how are you sort of seeing that in response to the technical work that you're presenting them with? And I'm looking at you, Sahar, because we're going to go up the line in reverse order. So I'll start with you. So your question is sort of how is the industry receptive to efforts yes. to decarbonize? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would say in the oil and gas space, I mean, we are seeing advancements in uh, sort of EPA policy that is m pushing this, uh, this space along and, and applying sort of pressure to industry in order to implement a lot of the technologies that we've seen today. We're seeing regulations that are supporting sort of more technology agnostic approaches such as aircraft surveys for identifying um, sort of methane leaks from oil and gas. And, and I would say, I mean, we've worked with some of the large players and sort of funding, funding some of this work who are interested in really identifying methane emissions and, and reducing them. Yeah, um, great. And we've got the methane fee in the IRA, which is like a little bit of a stick as well there. So. Jonathan, how about you? Yeah, uh, cost is everything. I mean, when it comes to, you know, these really big uh, industrial uh, commercial processes, um, I think, you know, for us, focusing on hydrogen production. We've been thinking about it in two ways together with industry. You know, the first is to see, given the relatively high cost of, of uh, green electricity, whether there is a pathway to make our technology cheaper compared to blue hydrogen um, as a point of comparison, mm -hmm. cost comparison. And, th and then the second, uh, in part because of cost and in part in, due to deployability, is to see how we can adapt this to uh, methane pyrolysis as a means for producing hydrogen in a way where the carbon can be captured uh, in, in a uh, more practical and economic way. Solid. Assuming that, yeah, solid carbon. So, so yeah, it, it begins and ends with cost and, and you just have to really make a case mm -hmm. that what you're doing is bringing value beyond what, what currently exists. Great, Tiziana? Well, uh, if I echo what uh, Jonah just say, cost also when it comes to cement uh, is very uh, important. Um, I, I think everyone has to play its part. Uh, so there is the part of the having uh, policies and, and that incentivize uh, the use or different technology. But at the same time, when it comes to uh, the cement industry, it's also an industry that has to um, innovate uh, a little bit more because if we think that Portland cement is, is the recipe is a recipe that comes from the 1800 has been definitely tweaked over time uh, but uh, but not that much and then the other thing is that if you it, it it's also a, a, an industry that needs to diversify uh, a little bit depending on the application. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the recipe, again, is a little bit uh, uh, tweaked, but if you have to build a skate, uh, skyscrapers uh, or a, a curbside, uh, the recipe does not change uh, much. So I think that uh, costs uh, are important, but also uh, innovation. Okay. Leora, briefly. I will echo what everybody just said before me um, in a slightly different way. So in steel, it's always about value added, that um, just decreasing the emissions is never going to make business sense unless you can show that doing so gives value added to the product that you generate. And so that manifests itself from the perspective of the business decisions that are made, but it also manifests itself from the perspective of the policy decisions that are made. So for example, Europe is one of the leaders in green steel, and the critical decision that enabled that was the carbon tax that was put in in Europe, that there was a critical point when that happened, that is when all of the different technologies in green steel started being, being born and coming out of that. And finding a way, you know, that, that changed the incentives, right? Because suddenly, economic sense did not lie in keeping business as usual, because suddenly business as usual became a lot more expensive than it used to be. And so finding ways, both at the policy level and at the technology level, of making it make economic and business sense to be able to decarbonize is absolutely the winning ticket to be able to uh, ensure decarbonization. And I'm sure that's not unique to steel. Great note to end on. Please join me in thanking our esteemed panelists.